Vaccine making isn't rocket science. It's a lot harder than rocket science. I'm Meredith Wadman. I'm a reporter with Science Magazine in Washington, D.C., and I'm also the author of The Vaccine Race, Science, Politics, and the Human Costs of Defeating Disease. And I'm here to talk about the race to develop a coronavirus vaccine. A vaccine is a virus or a bacterium that's been either killed or much weakened so that when it's injected in your body, it trains your immune system so that the next time your body is exposed to that microbe, it can fight it off very efficiently. They're as important or even more important than all the wonderful therapeutics we've developed over these years. And some of the reason for that is that when a large number of people in a community are vaccinated, they are protected, but also they protect the smaller fraction of people who are not immunized. And that is a societal benefit that has reaped huge rewards for humankind. We don't have precise estimates, but it's fair to say that vaccines over the course of time have saved tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of lives. The real tough hurdle in getting an effective vaccine is bringing it from a laboratory bench to a biological product that is safe, that is effective, that is the same when you dose it into tens and then hundreds and then thousands and then millions and tens of millions of people. Science these days is a tremendously collaborative international enterprise. Scientists work in a global community and I would venture to say that never has it been more so than in the fight against coronavirus where people are dropping everything they're doing and basically research has ground to a halt except for research on coronavirus. You can't make a vaccine until you've isolated the microbe that you're going to be vaccinating against. You have to capture it in a lab dish. You're either then going to kill it or you're going to much weaken it. Your next step, once you have a virus isolated and a vaccine made from it in the lab, you next need to test it in animals. These studies are also being performed extremely quickly in other situations. Take, for instance, Inovio, a Pennsylvania company that moved from creating a vaccine within hours of the sequence of the coronavirus being published by Chinese scientists to then testing it in animals in late January and February. And this month, it's going to be ready to be put into human beings. So even animal testing can be hastened in an urgent circumstance like this. So there are three phases of human trials. The first is called phase one, and it happens usually in tens or perhaps scores of volunteers. They are receiving for the, the vaccine for the first time as human beings, and scientists are looking both at its safety and its dosing. And that often takes months, sometimes into more than a year. In this case, it's being compressed into two or three months. Next, you have phase two. Now that's a test in hundreds of volunteers typically, and this time it's called a blinded test in that neither the scientists administering the vaccine or those receiving it know whether they're receiving the actual experimental vaccine or a dummy called a placebo. And at this stage, you're still looking at dosing. You're also looking at safety still, looking for signals. Now you've got a larger population being tested or somewhat rarer side effects might become visible. And finally, you're also looking at effectiveness. What level of, of antibodies are, are these vaccines generating? Phase three goes to in this case, probably with coronavirus, thousands of volunteers. It's still blinded, but now you're looking in a situation in which vaccinated and unvaccinated people are being exposed to coronavirus in the community and so on. Sometimes in traditional vaccine development, it's really tough to find an exposed population. However, with coronavirus, sadly, it's uh, probably gonna be fairly easy to find exposed communities. You then have to bring your product to the regulator and say, here are all our results from our human trials. And the regulator can take months and years to respond to that. FDA in this country has been moving extremely quickly with various permissions. And I think it's to be expected that they will not take months and years once they get a candidate application in front of them. It will likely be the case that in 
the first instance, once a vaccine is approved by regulators, it will go to those on the front lines, namely healthcare workers and others working closely with COVID-19 patients. That has to be the case really ethically, it seems to me. However, once that population has been protected, we hope, then one could envision it moving into the broader community. It needs to be said that there is going to be discussion, I imagine animated discussion, about who and how and when people are vaccinated. There's going to be products coming online, not all at once. There's going to be, I imagine, clamoring for the vaccine or vaccines. There's going to be some countries that have produced their own vaccine, other countries another. It's not going to be simple to get this vaccine distributed. You look at developing countries that just scarcely have the infrastructure to get even our existing vaccines out to their populations. And you just have to know that this highly infectious disease, if it doesn't reach them, will continue to circulate. How much this costs someone at a pharmacy or at a medical doctor's office is really going to be a function of whatever health system you're working in. The NHS is clearly very different to the United States system. One ballpark figure or one proxy might be the Prevnar 13 vaccine, which is against uh, pneumonia. Here in the States, at least, it costs about $800. That's just a very ballpark figure and you need to factor in all kinds of other considerations that are going to be at play during this unprecedented pandemic. Vaccines will be a huge part of ending this pandemic, but they won't be all the answer. We need therapies, we need antivirals, we need other ways of treating that are effective and efficient. So to the extent that those therapies are also in process, it's a tremendously important and hopeful time. I think of the last pandemic of an equivalent scale, the flu pandemic of 1918, and consider what the world was confronted with then, where they could only vaguely understand that this was transmitted by contact between people, but had none of the toolkit that we have today with modern biology and medicine to attack it. So I'm tremendously grateful that the world's best and brightest scientific and medical minds are, as a person, attacking this pandemic. And it gives me hope to know they're at work right now, even as we speak.